Hello, this is Edward Dawad, and in this podcast, I will be talking about biological membranes. More specifically, I will be talking about the chemical nature and chemical composition of biological membranes. I will be talking about the fluid mosaic model, a model that explains or d- describes the 3D arrangements of molecules within a biological membrane. I will talk about the how the composition how the nature, chemical nature of biological molecules affects membrane permeability and fluidity. And finally, I will talk about how the composition of biological molecules are important in determining how cells interact with each other to form tissues in multicellular organisms. So let's start with a quick review of the chemical nature of biological membranes. So if we uh, look at this animal cell and then if we zoom in on its plasma membrane uh, uh, on this area what we will see is the following so this is a section of the plasma membrane and we see the phospholipid bilayer consisting of two layers of uh, phospholipid molecules uh, stacked next to each other and oriented in such a way that the hydrophilic parts are facing the aqueous environment of the membrane, whether it is inside the cell or outside the cell. And the hydrophobic tails, those are the hydrocarbon tails of the phospholipid molecules, oriented towards the inside, away from water. So this is true for all biological membranes, whether those membranes are plasma membranes or membranes surrounding vesicles or organelles inside the cytoplasm. The arrangement of molecules, of phospholipid molecules, as well as other molecules that we find in biological membranes, uh, is known as the fluid mosaic model, the 3D arrangement of those molecules in space. Now, it's a model because um, we don't know exactly the, the, how those molecules interact with each other to, in 3D to give a certain shape, but from what we know about their chemical nature, we can assume that they take this arrangement and it's called fluid mosaic. First fluid because it's a fluid structure. It's always changing, always moving, always dynamic, and mosaic because it consists of different parts, not only the uh, uh, the the phospholipid bilayer. So if we look at the fluid part first, the fluid part of the model is analogous to the surface of water, always moving, always changing, and the mosaic part refers to the other molecules that are embedded within the phospholipid bilayer and then they are analogous to um, this buoy here for example which uh, keeps uh, bobbing up and down with the change in the surface of the water now the buoy here refers to the other molecules that are found uh, as part of the biological membranes so if we look at the chemical nature First, we have the phospholipids, the phospholipid bilayer. Also, we have other lipids that could be found uh, in the phospholipid bilayer, such as these yellow structures here, which are in that case here cholesterol. We also have proteins. And then finally, we have carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are found, for example, here, there. Those are oligosaccharides. And as you can see, they are found on the extracellular surface of the cell, not on the intracellular surface. And uh, their function is in giving identity to the cell. It's like the pin number of the cell that would allow a multicellular organism to recognize its own cells as opposed to foreign cells. The proteins that we find in the uh, phospholipid bilayer could be of two types based on their interaction with lipids. They could be um, um, found uh, deeply embedded in the phospholipid bilayer and therefore they are known as integral proteins or loosely bound to the phospholipid bilayer and therefore are known as peripheral proteins. Proteins in biological membranes serve different functions such as enzymes, 
receptors that can recognize signals from outside and cause change in the behavior of the cell. There could be transporters, transport proteins that allow the movement of, mo of molecules in and out of the cell. There could be ion channels that allow the passage of ions in and out of the cell, etc. Now, the composition of biological uh, molecules, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, affects the permeability and the fluidity of the membranes. So if we can imagine that we can measure the actual permeability of a membrane, and we put that measure on a scale, with the bottom part being here low permeability, and the upper part being high permeability. So as we can see, ions, charged particles, have very low permeability. They cannot cross the membrane. It's impossible for them to cross the membrane because they are charged, and they would interact with the heads of the phospholipids, preventing them from crossing the membrane. Polar molecules, large and polar molecules, also have difficulty crossing the membrane. Without the help of special proteins, transporter proteins, they cannot cross the membrane, and therefore the, the membrane is impermeable to those structures. Then we have small polar molecules. They can cross, but the permeability is low. The water, water molecules, the same thing. Water molecules are polar. They're small, but they are polar, and therefore the membrane has very low permeability to them. Some molecules can cross, depending on the spaces between the phospholipid molecules. But in general, um, water cannot cross very easily biological membranes, and it would require special proteins to allow them to cross. And finally, small nonpolar molecules, such as molecular oxygen or other small nonpolar molecules, can cross very easily, and the membrane has very high permeability to those molecules. Now, if we look at both permeability and fluidity of the membrane and how the composition of the biological membranes can influence that, there are three important factors here that would influence the permeability and the fluidity of biological membranes. The first one is the, the uh, chemical nature of the phospholipid molecules in the phospholipid bilayer. And that is influenced by the type of hydrocarbon chains that you have in the uh, phospholipid molecules. So in, in, in this structure here, this is a saturated one, meaning that all the carbons are saturated with hydrogen atoms. And this chain is unsaturated because of the double bond that is found between the two carbons here. And because of this unsaturation, it's going to cause a kink in the chain. So when you look at the phospholipid bilayer, in the top part here, this is a membrane with a phospholipid bilayer consisting mostly of saturated fatty acids, hydrocarbon chains. The molecules are very close to each other. The structure is very compact because of that. <clears throat> and this would cause a decrease in the permeability because there's very little space between the molecules and therefore a decrease in the fluidity it becomes more rigid as a structure. Whereas in the case of the lower part here, this membrane consists mostly of unsaturated tails with kinks that would cause bigger spaces between the molecules. So therefore the structure is not very compact because of that. And that would increase the space between the molecules and therefore would increase the permeability as well as the fluidity of the membrane. So this is the first factor. Another factor is the presence of other lipids in the phospholipid bilayer, such as cholesterol. So cholesterol could be present there. So if you have uh, cholesterol found there, so the more cholesterol you have in the spaces here, empty spaces, then this is going to decrease the permeability as well as the fluidity of the membrane. The less cholesterol you have or other lipids, the higher the permeability and the higher the fluidity. And then the last factor that would influence permeability and fluidity is temperature. As temperature increases, the kinetic energy of molecules would increase and would, would cause more vibration of these uh, molecules and therefore more space between them to be present at any given time and therefore an increase in permeability and increase in fluidity. Now, the composition also of biological membranes would influence how um, membranes of different cells would interact with each other. And this is important for uh, 
multicellular organisms were uh, especially important for their tissues and how cells interact within a given tissue. Um, so cell cell to cell connection uh, is important in a tissue. It, it, uh, it allows cells to adhere with each other, recognize each other, and adhere to each other, and this is important for the integrity of a tissue. And this is illustrated in this neat experiment here that was done on sponges. So in that experiment, they took two different sponges. They treat, treated them chemically to dissociate the cells. So the actual sponge is, is, is no longer there, but it's, what you have is the individual cells that make up the sponge. And then they mixed these two cells together, and then they allowed them to stand for a while, uh, knowing that sponges are known that when you dissociate the cells and you leave them alone, then the cells would associate together again to form back the sponge. But here what, we, what they did is they mixed these two together to see if they are going to form a hybrid sponge or not. And uh, to their surprise, what they got is that these cells associated into two different forms, uh, each form belonging to the original species. And this indicated that the actual cells of each species uh, can actually recognize each other and then they can associate with each other. And this is due, now we know, uh, to special proteins found in biological membranes on the surface known as cadherin proteins, cadherin for calcium adhesion proteins. So in the presence of calcium, those proteins would allow uh, cells that contain the same type of cadherins to interact with each other and to actually attach to each other, adhere to each other, thus forming tissues. The last topic of this podcast is the specialized cell junctions that we find in animal tissues. And there are three main types of cell junctions that we find in uh, animal tissues. The tight junctions, the desmosomes, and the gap junctions. And to illustrate these structures, we are going to uh, take the example of a small intestine in the digestive system. So if we look at this area here, and then if we enlarge this area, we are going to take a segment of the small intestine, cut it open to see what's inside. So this is the inner wall here of the small intestine. As, as you can see, we can see folds. Those are known as the villi to increase the surface area. And then when we take a certain area and then we magnify it, we get this. So we're looking at this is one villus. This is another villus here. And then we look at one of the villi here and then we magnify to see the cells that, that form the lining. And that's where those junctions are going to be found. So if we take an example of those cells, so those cells, so this is one cell here. Okay. And then we can see an illustration of the three types of junctions. So the first type is here. This is the tight junctions. The second type are the desmosomes. And the third type are the gap junctions. So we're showing here the three types of junctions. The tissue uh, uh, doesn't have to have all three of them within the same tissue. It could, it could have one, two, or maybe three, depending on the type. Here, just for the sake of illustration, we're showing all three of them. So let's look first at the, the tight junctions. So if we if we look at the tight junctions, so we see those proteins here. So this is this is one membrane, this is another membrane. So these are two different cells, and we're showing the membranes of two different cells. And these these membranes are actually um, attached to each other through those specialized proteins that we find here. They're very analogous to the buttons of a shirt. Um, so they or, or like a zipper, more like a zipper actually. So they zip one membrane to the other. And the main function of tight junctions is to restrict the movement of any proteins found in the membrane, for example, here, to move because of the fluidity of the membrane to another side, because they are needed specifically in one side of the cell than the other. And this is important. The other function of uh, tight junctions is to restrict or to prevent the movement of molecules, 
um, between these spaces, that the space that you find between cells. So that would restrict their movement because you want to control what is being absorbed by these cells from the lumen of the intestine into the blood. The second type is uh, desmosomes. And again here, the, these desmosomes, they anchor one cell to the other through special proteins found in their membranes. And uh, there are different types of proteins involved in desmosomes. The first one is proteins that would form the disc here, the discs, and then other proteins that would link or anchor one disc to the other. Um, and then these discs are connected to intermediate filaments from the cytoskeletal proteins of uh, these cells and therefore anchoring cells together. You would find these, um, this type of uh, junction in, for example, skin tissue uh, to uh, make uh, the skin tissue very firm and uh, um, uh, where cells are uh, connected to each other and that it's very difficult to separate them from each other. And the last type of cell junction, specialized cell junctions, is that of the gap junction. So again here we have one cell here, one cell there, and in the gap junction there's a gap between the two cells, and then the the two cells are connected by special proteins known as connexons, and those proteins they assemble in such a way that they form bridges between cells. So the cytoplasm of one cell is bridged to the cytoplasm of another cell in such a way that molecules or particles can cross from one cytoplasm through the canal, the channel here, to another cell. You would find these um, gap junction, junctions mostly in um, excitable tissues, such as nerve tissue. Um, also, you will find them in the heart, um, between uh, heart muscle cells. And the function of uh, gap junctions is to facilitate the communication between cells, fast communication between cells. So whenever you need fast communication, things to spread, a message to spread quickly from one cell to the other, you would find these gap junctions. And that would conclude our podcast.